A new study is sparking concern with hair loss reported in up to 15% of patients using drugs like Ozempic, Wagovi, Monjaro, and other GLP-1 agonists. In this video, we'll dive into the study, we'll separate fact from fiction, and we will reveal how you can protect yourself while using these medications. My name is Rob English. I'm a researcher who specializes in hair loss disorders. I'm on the editorial board of a dermatology journal, and I run the website perfecthairhealth.com, which is a center for education and consumer advocacy for all things hair loss. Check out our free guides, our free articles, our free videos. And if you want private support from me personally, that's also offered on the site, check it out. A new study is out suggesting that GLP-1 drugs might not only help you lose weight, but inadvertently also help you lose your hair. Now for years, we've heard Reddit horror stories of people claiming they took these drugs and then months later their hair took a massive nosedive. And now there's finally a study corroborating these claims. But what does the study really say? And should we actually be concerned? Well, as always, there's a bit of nuance to the answers and the internet hates nuance. I don't hate nuance, I love nuance. So let's unpack what the evidence does and does not say. So this was a retrospective study done out of the University of Miami through somebody named Antonella Tosti. She is a juggernaut in the hair loss world. She's highly published, pretty cool lady. And her team assessed a cohort of 283 patients seen at their dermatology clinic between 2021 and 2023. There were a mix of both male and female adults with obesity. And while visiting this dermatology clinic, they were coincidentally also using GLP-1s to treat either insulin resistance or obesity. During the study period, the average patient, they lost 6% of their body weight. That's great. And being at a dermatology clinic, these patients were also asked a bit of questions about how their hair was doing during that time they were using these medications. Here is what those patients reported. During the study window, 207 patients, so nearly 85% of GLP-1 users, reported no hair loss. That's awesome. In fact, only 1% of patients with no prior hair loss history reported new hair loss during the study. I really like those odds so far. But of the 13% of patients with pre-existing hair loss, over 90% of those patients reported a worsening of hair loss during the time they were using their GLP-1s. And a further statistical analysis actually showed that semiglutides were linked to the hair loss disorder called androgenic alopecia, and terzapatide was linked to the hair loss disorder telogen effluvium. And interestingly, these findings aligned with a previous study showing the same signal for increased hair loss from both semiglutides and terzapatides from FDA adverse event reporting systems. Thus, the conclusion from these researchers was that while there's no strong association with GLP-1s and hair loss across all patients, patients with pre existing hair loss and who are using these GLP-1s, especially semiglutide and terzepatides, those patients might be at risk of their hair loss worsening while using the drug. But to be clear, the authors are very careful not to make any causal statements. They emphasize that the paper is just hypothesis generating and that we can't really infer much from retrospective data aside from signals to study in bigger, better designed clinical trials. So what can we make of this data? And if you're considering or using a GLP-1 drug, should you actually be concerned about hair loss? Well, if we zoom out, what we can see, according to the study, is that for those with no hair loss to begin with, the risk of developing new hair loss while on a GLP-1 drug was very small, around 1%. And if we're being candid, that 1% risk, it's probably not that much different from being an adult and during a one to two year time period, beginning to show signs of hair loss and then receiving an androgenic alopecia diagnosis without ever having used a GLP-1 agonist during that period. After all, androgenic alopecia, it's incredibly common. In adults, its prevalence increases by 10 percentage point per decade of life. So if you're 50, odds are you've got at least a touch of androgenic alopecia. And if you are 80, you'd be an anomaly to not show any signs of it whatsoever. Having said that, for those with pre-existing hair loss, the study does appear to suggest that hair loss might worsen while using these medications, particularly on semi-glutides and for those with androgenic alopecia. But Keep in mind that androgenic alopecia, if it's left untreated, is going to worsen anyway by about 5% per year. So the right question to ask is not, did your androgenic alopecia get worse while using a GLP-1 drug? It's, did your androgenic alopecia get worse 
faster than it would have if you had never used that GLP-1 to begin with? And we actually can't answer that question in this study because <laughs> candidly, it's kind of terribly designed. There's no randomization, there's no control group. I kid you not, the study doesn't even measure how long somebody was using a GLP-1 drug. Was it one month, a year, 10 years? The researchers also didn't even track hair changes objectively, like through hair counts with a photo trichogram. Instead, they just asked patients to report how they felt about their hair since starting GLP-1s. Suffice it to say that without these variables controlled for, you can argue, probably pretty convincingly, that these patients aren't reporting a worsening of their androgenic alopecia because of GLP-1s. Rather, they're simply reporting the natural progression of their androgenic alopecia, regardless of whether they were using GLP-1s. Now, some research groups have speculated that GLP-1 agonists can potentially cause hair loss through at least two pathways. The first pathway is that the drugs might dysregulate signaling proteins in the hair cycle, which might explain any excessive hair shedding reported within the first few weeks of treatment. Personally, I think the jury is still out on this, but I'm also totally open to this being a possibility for a small number of patients using GLP-1s. And secondly, and this is the most convincing pathway in my opinion, it's not that these drugs directly cause hair loss. Rather, it's that the GLP-1 drugs help to regulate insulin and also appetite, which helps you lose weight pretty consistently. And when you lose a lot of weight too quickly, that prolonged calorie deficit has been well studied to disrupt our hair cycle and cause a temporary kind of hair loss known as telogen effluvium. This would account for hair loss occurring not after weeks, but maybe after months of GLP-1 use. And interestingly, if you have untreated androgenic alopecia during that time window, any telogen effluvium shed is going to come with the risk of accelerating your androgenic alopecia because the shedding of the hair creates a new opportunity for effective hair follicles to grow back in the next hair cycle as a little bit thinner. If you wanna learn more about this, watch our videos on conflating hair loss cause and effect, watch our video on telogen effluvium. But it's my belief that this is the most likely cause of GLP-1 related hair loss. You get temporary hair shedding not due to the drug itself, but instead due to the weight loss caused by the drug, which can then exacerbate other underlying hair loss conditions. So if you're considering using a GLP-1 drug, do you need to be concerned about this? Well, if you don't have any hair loss to begin with, the data so far suggests that you shouldn't be concerned much at all. But if you already have hair loss, especially androgenic alopecia, which, by the way, starts subclinically, meaning that you can have it, but you don't know about it, and you usually won't really know about it until about 30% or more of your hair volume is gone. That's where I see the most risk with these GLP-1 drugs and the weight loss associated with them. Now, the good news about this is that this is all super manageable and through at least two strategies. First, if you ramp up GLP-1 dosing slowly at the start of treatment, you won't have as abrupt weight loss in the first few months, it should happen a little bit more slowly, and that will also reduce your risk of weight loss-induced telogen effluvium. And I find it encouraging that most doctors would do this anyway to just ensure that you can tolerate the medication. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly, if you are using a GLP-1 drug and you have untreated androgenic alopecia, it's probably in your best interest to start a hair loss treatment alongside that if you want to preserve your hair. Minoxidil, finasteride, dutasteride, even to some extent natural interventions, they can target hormonal pathways that govern the process of pattern hair loss. And so if you want to reduce your risk of that worsening during your time of weight loss, you may also want to consider pairing GLP-1s with treatments for androgenic alopecia. There are a lot of options out there. We started a brand, Ulo, to help provide people with the best-in-class treatments for androgenic alopecia or pattern hair loss. However, we are not the only shop out there. Check the links below for more information. Really, what matters most is that you're following treatments that have high evidence quality. And for more information on that, check out our massive video on how to fix hair loss in men. And with that, I'd like to make two more points. First, I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about the semiglutide and terzepatide signals here with hair loss. I think that's mostly just a function of the medications that are most commonly prescribed. So you'll get an over-indexing of adverse events reported in the FAERS database simply because those medications are prescribed 
more frequently than other types of GLP-1s. And then secondly, there might be a point in the future where GLP-1 agonists, they actually might be used to help fight certain hair loss disorders. There are some hair loss subclassifications that could be driven in part through factors like insulin insensitivity. Investigators are currently exploring treatments like metformin and certain GLP-1s for these hair loss types, and very preliminary research suggests a signal of benefit, but we'll know more with bigger and better studies. And when that happens, we'll make more videos on this topic in the future. That's all for today. For those using GLP-1s, let me know your experience in the comments. And for everybody else, I hope this video helps you make more informed treatment decisions. Thank you for watching.